Abwaschte, Tanze, um, Sissy Ned Siegerson. So my name is Sissy Thiessen Kutnail. Um, I am family from Alexis Nakota Sioux Nation. I don't know if you remembered that, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Alexis Nakota Sioux Nation um, and Steinbeck, Manitoba. So yeah, I am Stony or Nakota Sioux. Cree and German Mennonite, and I live in Edmonton, Alberta, or a Miskwichi Waskahegan Beaver Hills house. Awesome. Um, Dante and hello. My name is Janelle Piwopskonius. I come from Little Pine First Nation, um, born and raised, and then moved away for a period of time to Saskatoon to do education and get learnt. And that was really great. It, it really helped me connect to people from across the country. And um, yeah, it's been really neat to, to be on this journey. So I guess our first question today is like, what does two-spirit mean to you? <clears throat> and so two-spirit isn't a term that I quite fully knew what it meant. Um, I didn't have any... Um, um, there was a bit of erasure, I guess, in my teachings growing up about two-spiritedness. Um, even then, uh, two-spirit wasn't even a term, I guess. Um, you were more like gay, um, even worse so, only identifying them with slurs like the F words and the the D words and all the other words, and rather than calling them as they are. Um, and however they identify. And so a lot of these people um, went in a bad way and sometimes they unalived themselves and sometimes they just left and didn't come, didn't come back. So there was a lack of presence of two-spirit identified people who had just lived in their glory. So my coming of understanding what two-spirit means didn't come till I was an adult and even more so the understanding of what two-spirit means wasn't um, a teaching or an unraveling of what it meant until recently even um, as trainings become more public as the information becomes more available online that's how I am able to access this information this this community which is kind of part of the dynamic of what it's like to be two-spirit and so that's how I came into understanding what two-spirit means to me Hmm. I am currently the Two-Spirit Community Educator for I mentioned Two-Spirit Society, or E2S. Um, there's lots of different videos that we have on this topic on YouTube. We have a Two-Spirit Learning Series, so you just search E2S on YouTube, you can find lots of things. Um, Joanne Saddleback has a fantastic video about the um, eight Cree genders and explains a lot about that. That's available. Harlan Pruden has got great videos on what this means. So the question was what it means to us, but I just wanted to make sure that people get resources because even though I'm the community educator, I'm still learning because Two-Spirit is, it was coined in 1990, I believe, and that's why I was looking for it, for, by Beverly Little Thunder. I, mm -hmm. I'm like 97% certain. Um, and it was like, a placeholder term that was created at this like gathering of um, a queer indigenous people back in 1990. It was this term that was supposed to be like a placeholder and a bookmark um, until people found the oh, their own words and their own languages from their communities. So I don't know. Like I'm quite so I'm quite disconnected from my like Stony and Dakota Sioux teachings. A lot of the teachings I have are from all over the place because. I was raised without my culture, so um, from when I was, you know, a, a baby until I was, you know, moved out on my own, I was raised primarily just by my European family, so I was missing those cultural teachings, and um, and I had like a basic idea of like LGBTQ, like I pretty sure I knew what that word meant, mm -hmm. but crossing the two, so like I was on a journey to discover my indigenous culture, heritage, family. And then I realized at like 25 I came out um, as pansexual, the colonial word. And maybe, maybe there was a term, maybe there was a term in Nakota Sioux or Stony, but I don't know. Um, and then there's those different gender, Cree gender words about like a blank person who presents feminine, a blank person who presents masculine, a masculine person who also does feminine things. Like there's, there's different words like that. 
because there's, there's, you know, to a spirit is kind of all encompassing and it's like a pan indigenous kind of word and it's an English word. So, you know, people are like, that doesn't mean there's a lot of naysayers. It's like, you don't have two spirits. You're not special. But I've been told that in a lot of communities that, that two spirit people or whatever the word is, again, that's not necessarily the term, mm -hmm. were revered to be able to live in that in-between place of the masculine and the feminine and, and live between those two circles um, and do warrior and gatherer and nurturer and protector and be able to mediate between conflicts and things like that. So there's like sacred cultural teachings and responsibilities that goes along with having that term to spirit or whatever it is in the language. Um, so it's, it's a pan indigenous word right now for, for an indigenous person who is LGBTQ plus. Um, but I, through going to gatherings and sitting with elders and medicine people in the community, have learned that, like, if I myself am willing to take on responsibilities of being a peacekeeper, a mediator, or I actually identify as a contrary person, so somebody who calls things out, and so I'm not necessarily a peacekeeper, but, and my spirit name has to do with wind, and there's a deity, a two-spirit deity that is... Uh, translated crazy wind person so that's somebody who shakes things up and that's somebody who says things people don't necessarily want to hear and like I believe those all and I was named with windy in the title and I sat with a medicine person they're like that is such a two-spirit name <laughs> that's so I didn't even yeah it's just coming into an identity and accepting cultural responsibility that's being an indigenous person that's what two-spirit means to me that was long. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Cool. So I guess maybe that leads into our next question of what is your relation to two-spiritedness and the two-spirit community? Um, my relation, so uh, like I said, I am the E2S community educator and I identify as a member of the community and only recently and with hesitation because I'm really thinking about like, do I take on all of those responsibilities? Do I have them all? Do I have to have a hundred percent? What is the number? Like what is the, there's so much getting caught up in like quantums and everything like that. Mm -hmm. I can't help it. Um, yeah. So I identify as part of the community. Um, I was a board member with E2S. I was a dancer, performer, and volunteer educator for E2S, mm -hmm. and now I was a COVID response coordinator as a contractor, and then now I'm the educator. So I've gone from board member, it's been a multi-year journey. So within the community specific to where I live, that's kind of my involvement and my relationship. I'm in the community. I'm only recently, because before I would say, I am pansexual, I am queer, and I still use those, I still use those labels. Um, but I do identify as part of the community. I'm starting to receive teachings, which is really cool, um, that I'm not able to get anywhere else from Gabe Calderon and their partner Pilar. Um, just learning. Um, I'm going to get to learn how to make a sweat lodge mm -hmm. with Elder Leonard Saddleback. And I'm really, I know that, that how lucky I am to have that opportunity because women or feminine people, because I do identify as a two-spirited woman, um, aren't typically or traditionally allowed um, to build lodges, to fire keep, to do a lot of different things, basically only allowed to prepare food and sit in like a quarter or less space in a lodge. It's just very, it can be quite restrictive and there's reasons for that, but um, yeah, that's kind of, yeah, I guess I'm, I guess I'm really in there. I competed for Montana Two-Spirit, Miss Montana Two-Spirit pageant two or three times. Mm. It's an international Two-Spirit gathering. Um, I live in Edmonton on White Avenue. There's a corner called Pride Corner because there's street preachers who will preach like <laughs> terrible homophobic Bible verses and spew them as hate speech and they're allowed to be there. And so... Uh, the queer community has decided to take up space there and mm. play music and dance and there's been some really unfortunate interactions, you know, by extremists, right? But so I'll go and do that because it's in my neighborhood. So I don't know. It's pretty ingrained. It's pretty ingrained into my life and what I do. And the last thing I'll say on this is I'm a drag artist. And so that's I'm actually in a 
heterosexual presenting relationship with a cisgendered man, and I present as a cisgendered female, which is what I am. Um, and so I was telling my partner that this relationship, I was worried about it taking my like two spirit card. Mm. Uh, that's real for me, and mm -hmm. um, I, I'm like taking some of that cred away. And he's the one who encouraged me, like, get into your drag, like, do it. He's the one who really like encouraged me to go hard and fast into it. And him and his cousin helped me film, helped me edit, helped me. He let me clothes, gave me clothes. Like he's been so he wrapped my chest. Like he's been so supportive, and so that's helped me out of anything, like. Sitting and getting teachings, yes. Being in community, yes. Being a board member, sure. But it's the drag, it's the drag that really helped me like connect and feel comfortable identifying as a two-spirit person. I've got Stony Rivers, my drag king character, and then I've got Sissy, me. So yeah, that's my relationship to, to that. <laughs> mm, awesome, cool. So for me, um. I'm also cis, and for those who don't know, cis is C-I-S. It means like you are born and you identify and you uh, outwardly show your gender that you were born with, okay? And then there's trans, whereas you don't quite feel at home with the gender you were born with, the body you are born with. And sometimes that means you are another gender, sometimes it means you're both genders, sometimes that means you're all genders, and sometimes it means you're none. So it's, it's up to you. And so those are the terms that we're using today in this video. And so I identify as cis, definitely. Um, and I say definitely because I've tried trans identity when I was young. I grew up as like tomboy, I guess. Um, mostly because I didn't have quite feminine people in my life. Um, my mom was, is a cis hetero person. So, you know, this is the, this is the norm. This is what I grew up with. Um, I had room to be with my brothers and my cousins. Um, I got to play however I wanted. Um, I was really annoyed when I was forced to wear skirts because, you know, it's kind of a cultural custom to wear skirts to ceremony and my parents followed that custom. And, um, I knew back then that I didn't quite fully accept or want to be a female or a woman. Um, but it was also very shamey to explore. I tried the name Kyle on once when I was in grade four or grade five, and I was shamed publicly from my teacher for it. And so it internalized a lot of different things for me and to become comfortable and have that space has always been a challenge since then, because I've become to learn from my own community, from my people I hold safe, that this is not for you. This is not what, okay, this is not normal. And then layered on top of that is that there's some teachings that I'm questioning and like wondering how much influence the Catholic Church had with our teachings around um, gender. Um, as Sissy said, like um, I'm just coming into teachings about the multiple genders that there are um, within the Cree culture, the Nihio people. And um, I, I don't know where I am on there, so I'm hesitant to put myself as well with a label because I, don't, I thought I was bisexual for a long time. And then I was like, wait a minute, I don't find bodies to be hotties. Like, I just don't feel, so what does that mean? I, I like this, but then I, and then I realized I like hearts more yes. than bodies. Yes. And that's where I, I don't know, that's where I fall in love is with people who have like amazing ideas, who can play, who can be a bad boy even. And even though it's a toxic thing, you know, it's still like that energy, that heart that I am attracted to. So if we're putting labels on it, that's demisexual, pansexual, or omnisexual. And I'm not sure where I fit on that yet because on top of this complicated um, exploration in my newly middle age, I guess, <laughs> coming, aging out of the youth, uh -huh. sunsetting on my youth years. I can still get a youth loan though this year. Right on. <laughs> so I'm, I have that to bank on, we'll see. Um, but uh, as I'm going through these, I have a son, he's 10, and um, his father's not present. And then there's that complicated uh, past between um, domestic violence and abuse and then that relationship. And so now I'm like, where do you find space to explore when you're a mother? Um, 
And so that's challenging for me. It makes me feel like I can't connect to the community, but I do know that these thoughts and complications and these are all part of the community. We're all questioning and sometimes invalidating ourselves in, yeah. in, the, in the shame that we're in this exploration. So for me, it's like hard to settle on something because I'm constantly exploring. And as I'm learning about two-spiritedness, it's also hard for me to feel like I can explain and outwardly say that I am because of the teachings of it, of the responsibility, of the care, of the holding yourself sacred. You know, those are all things that I find important. So in coming into that, it's like almost like I have to change my life and that's scary. Yes. That's really scary. I grew up uh, with toxic masculinity in my family, all around me, in my community to the space to express doesn't really quite happen. I can, I can do it at home, I can do it where in my family, I can do it with my sisters because we found safe space between ourselves, between me and my sisters to like explore and identify and accept each other. Oh, my heart. Mm -hmm. And like they can be outward and however they want. My sister is non-binary, she uses they, or they use they, I'm still getting used to it. And I'm so proud of that. Because maybe, maybe they will change eventually. But um, you know, having seeing that, it's like that's a big change. Because like, there's ten years difference between me and my younger siblings. So I'm so proud that I can make that space for them. So I know expression is important. So I have to get brave too, you know. Mm -hmm. But I also am like self care. Mm -hmm. So it's like this constant like growth and healing, and that's part of the journey, part of the journey. And so my connection to the two-spirit community is introductory, to just be honest. I'm trying to learn more about where I fit and what things mean. I've learned a lot about the history and how colonialism has taken trans people, two-spirit people, uh, gender diverse people f first. They were almost like the first thing to get eaten by colonialism when they approached mm -hmm. new lands. Mm -hmm. Then there was that erasure, and then they went after the women, and then the children, and that's how, and then the men, and then that's how they ate us all. Like if you're thinking of colonialism as a beast, mm -hmm. and um, that's why we don't have these connections to these teachings. That's why there's this gender binary that's really being upheld by certain circles within our communities. It's like there's no space to be free with these identities and that's kind of, that's hard. That's unwelcoming and that's assimilation. So I'm unclear as to, because the bound markers keep moving. Right? Yep. Yeah. And then, but I'm also finding community and just knowing that, um, that there's time. This is not a race. This is a exploration. This is a journey. And our communities need to heal to be also be able to have safer spaces. And I use safer in brackets R because we can't really truly have safe space, I think, I think. But we can have safer space and intention to be safer. Um, right. So for me, it's just learning, but also trying to provide space, even though I'm an introductory person and I'm a learner. And um, trying to find my sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we need uh, with our gender diverse, sexual diverse um, people. It's just, you know, that safety. safety. Yeah, I just wanted to mm -hmm. um, riff on something you said about like, even though you're still learning, it's important to, to create the space and kind of be an advocate. Um, when I took the position, you know, I was really clear in my interview. I was like, I don't know. I know a little bit. I don't know much. I don't know if I'm your person. And there's a lot of that self-shaming that second guessing going on and then I realized that like if that it's of course understandable that those of us in these positions are still learning because colonization everyone says it's what is it 167 plus years but really it's more it's hundreds of years that this assimilation and colonization has been taking place and so it's not like you said it's not a race mm -hmm. it's going to take time it's going to take time to undo unlearn um, decolonize ourselves and we can do it in small little ways 
And for me, by being brave and taking this job, even though I'm scared I'm going to do a disservice, I'm scared that I'm not the right person, like that, that I've been told that makes me the right person. Mm -hmm. You know, if I, I'm trying to be mindful, I'm trying to be cognizant, I've got empathy and compassion and like I'm putting a lot of heart and emotion into it and that's what we need right now. That's what people need right now. Um, I'm by no means, none of us are experts in, in anything. I was taught that like we are all students until we die. We will never get all the knowledge. We'll never get it. We'll always be learning. Mm -hmm. Elders in their 80s with multiple lodges, they say the same thing. I've heard them say the same thing. Like, I'm still learning. I don't know it all. I never will. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to... And then the thing you also said about being attracted to souls and spirits, minds, hearts, that's, that's me as well. And I wrote a whole piece about it. I should have shared that. <laughs> Maybe I still can. I don't know. Um, and I came up with my own term, but I don't use it because it's not... It's not widely recognized. It's like spirit sexual or soul sexual. Mm. I kind of came up with that myself, but there's that whole, um, I'm a little bit scared to use it because there's a lot of like people under fire for like, ah, oh, this alphabet soup just keeps getting bigger and bigger and I have mm. so many words to learn and like <laughs> queers in our own community, like an indigenous like person who is pushing 50 in my community doesn't has said that like they don't know about pronouns and they're not super interested in learning and like mm. um and, and people similar to that as well saying similar things like I don't know about these words like and I get it like they just had to survive and yeah. you know basic 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 and just survive I get it but that's kind of why we're at where we're at now but I totally vibe with that like Mm. spirits, hearts, minds, not so much about like the skin sack that it comes in, like, you know <laughs> the, what I the mean? The meat suit, yeah. The meat suit, yeah. <laughs> but it's a bonus if the meat suit's nice. Right? Yeah. Yeah, 100%, 100%. I mean, an attractive meat suit is an attractive meat suit, so. Awesome. <laughs> okay, well, I didn't really prepare any more questions, but oh, if you feel comfortable, would you want to share that poem? Sure. It's up to you. You don't. I am not confused. I'm not open for interpretation, scrutinization, or assessment. I'm not an appetizer available for all to order. I don't have an insatiable appetite and look at everyone like a delectable conquest. And I don't wear whichever team jersey I happen to find comfortable that day. I didn't dig deep into the corners of my mind, weigh my choices, and then choose the best option based on convenience. As if souls and hearts are options and I could shade gray with a pencil. My love is a wonderful fool. It does not understand the idea of gender, nor does it care. My admiration does not see a gender or race, an income or title. My heart sees a human. It recognizes the greatness of another, regardless of the case of flesh, bones, and blood they live within. My wild, uninhibited, foolish love recognizes and chooses its beautiful, shining counterpart. If it could shade an option box gray with lead, it would choose greatness, kindness, compassion, generosity, integrity, courage, strength, ambition. And just because my beating red heart is a fool does not mean its opinion is any less valuable. It does not mean its love is any less real. Because trust me, it burns like a blazing fire and has been heating the inside of my swollen ribcage for years. Just because it cannot be defined in a dictionary, and I choose not to write myself within it, does not mean it is not as real as the air we breathe, the earth we touch, or water we were created within. I am not to be feared, loathed, and assume of my perceived frivolous intentions. I'm not trying to cast as wide of a net as possible to capture the most amount of fish. My love does not ask for a man, woman, or non-binary body. It does not have the words. Nor does it want to. My spirit sees greatness and it wants to be with greatness. My heart is clearer about this than crystal in the sunshine. My mind understands this like the moon understands the wolf. I am not confused. Hmm. 
Yeah, I, I like that. I think that's a great segue into the last question. Maybe we can like get into a bit about um, not something like what do you look forward to, but like what is what what are the possibilities for our two spirit community? Mm. What are the possibilities for two spirit community? You know, I did just share. I think it's your turn. Okay. <laughs> Some possibilities. Well, I live in Little Pine, which is right next to Palmaker. And some possibilities um, in just being able to um, be and to build a small community of people who are just LGBTQ, 2S+, identified queer, or an ally even, but preferably the, the former <laughs> as the center. I think it would be really great to, um, what I look forward is to just being present, to being able to support those spaces of people out loud and proud, and to also encourage young people to um, be themselves. You know, authenticity and vulnerability is so important to decolonizing, and the added pressure of just being other in this, in this society is hard. So if you're able to be vulnerable and authentic in your identity and just being, that is so strong. So why not be that model or that person who is that way? That's a little thing for me to be able to do to help people come up, to help older people or people my age to come out. It'll help people who are held onto the world on their shoulders just to survive. Mm -hmm. will know that this next generation is going to be okay. And that's what I think the hope is for me, despite all the ugly that can happen. I don't believe in that. <laughs> I believe in the, the hope in the future. Yeah. Oh, amazing. <laughs> I hope for the same. I do hope for the same thing. I do work for an organization that focuses a lot on like, Let's get on the amount of dollars that we can get to do programming to support people, which is so valid. You know, um, through COVID, our community suffered, got hit the hardest. I, oof, yeah, my heart. Um, I was the COVID response coordinator and got to review the applications for emergency funding. And some of those, actually all of them, heartbreaking, heartbreaking mm -hmm. stuff. And it all ties <laughs> together. Like we know, right, that... Uh, Poverty and mental illness and addiction all tie into oppression and colonization. So, so like the two spirit community, like not only have the weight of being indigenous on our backs, but then also being part of that alphabet rainbow. So it's like two different. It's like a dub, double oppression. Double is bad. And so, like, my organization is led by um, Jeff Shalfu, who is a visionary. Visionary does many things at one time um there's a lot of talk about i don't know like we have an international we have a retreat coming up at a really nice lake so we're going to bring people um and their families to come and just relax enjoy eat get teachings get ceremony um and then there's going to be a international two-spirit gathering at metis crossing in smoky lake alberta and there's video series, and there's now a two-spirit educator going to schools, organizations, communities. There's still emergency support funding, medicine. Um, we've got a knowledge keeper council. Like there's, as an organization, like I'm very in this kind of bubble right now. Um, so like s visibility, like we came out for like, not even on work time. Like I'll, I'll go to Pride Corner and I'll represent, you know what I mean? And I'll... And I've been in, and I get asked to do interviews like this quick on the fly on the, all the time or pictures or whatever, um, video projects. And I think the more visible that we are, just like you said, the, the easier it makes it for others to feel safe and like they're not alone and like they have solidarity and support. And I just hope that you know, this continues, the, the opportunities that I have to, you know, access knowledge keepers and provide support and programming and be immersed in the community that that happens for hundreds of thousands of people. Like that's what I hope the future looks like, that this work can keep happening. And it's, whew, it's hard work. 
it is a lot of work like emotionally like as an individual personally and like we've been talking about like the unpacking that has to happen constantly um and then it's also employment for me and it's also an interest for me and it's also a passion so it's like a lot <laughs> but i just hope that it continues my involvement or not whatever happens for me or not i hope that um, others can get like they go to international gatherings in the states and, and they compete in pageants and they feel safe to go at Pride Corner on White Ave in Edmonton and I don't know if it's here in Saskatoon or Saskatchewan but um, yeah competing in that pageant the whole time I'm like why are you doing this I'm terrified no he's lost to trans women granted fair um, but I was like there's always going to be something for me I've learned in my life that, that makes me different. So like when I was competing in the pageant, I was the different one and I always placed last and I felt really bad about it. And then I realized, you know what, like I went out there and I, you know, represented for the, it's not like we need a whole lot, but like cisgendered, soul, pansexual, indigenous women out there. I didn't win, but I went out there and I tried. And I validated myself and maybe some other people by doing that. So, yeah, I just hope all stuff continues. We try to be as healthy as we can be, supporting each other, taking care of ourselves, <laughs> self-love, compassion, and care so that we can help everybody else. That's kind of, that's what I hope for for the future. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time, Sissy. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks for having me out here from Poundmaker, Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. Staying in Little Pine with my friend Janelle. <laughs> yeah. And thanks to M for recording and for Floyd Favol for mm -hmm. directing the festival and having us. Awesome. Cool. Thank you.